Excellent. Good to go. We're living on a disk, floating through space with a tiny sun. Hey, I'm FDFE. Welcome back to the channel that ties stupidity to the train tracks of knowledge. Monday night, so it's Monday night debate time. And tonight I am joined by Tim Osman of the Infinite Plane Society. So let's just start. And Tim, welcome to the channel. Would you like to introduce yourself and tell people uh, what you're about and why you think the Earth is the shape that you think it is? Yeah, thanks a lot for having me. Uh, my channel, Infinite Plane Society, it's uh, meant to draw a distinction between the Flat Earth Society, which I think have come to too many conclusions without enough evidence. And so to me, it's more like infinite possibilities. It's flat until proven otherwise. I don't assert an ice wall. I reject the notion of a dome and any biblical explanation, which is worse than pseudoscience. It's mysticism. So uh, most of the so-called Flat Earth community does not like what we do because we do not accept the biblical authority. And so... Uh, my take on it is this. Um, I arrive at not a conclusion, but at the negation of the conclusion that we're on a ball because I don't trust those same authorities that the people who believe we are trust. I think there's plenty of reason to think we've been deep faked about science. And so for me, I'm going to need more evidence, and I don't accept what I've been shown thus far. Okay, thank you. So your your main reason for, for not accepting the, the main narrative is mistrust then, right? Yes, largely mistrust. Um, what about the, the the fundamental forces of physics that, that we can understand and measure? Do you disagree with how they work, like things like gravity and you know, centrifugal acceleration? I don't disagree with these things. I don't deny that they exist. I'm just saying that the explanations we're given are probably skewed. So I'm not in denial of any of the things that you observe or I observe. And moreover, I don't augment my reality with anything I can't observe. So, for example, some people will say they can see the curve when they look at the horizon. And I would say, well, that's impossible. That's somebody imposing what they're expected to believe. Okay. Um, so what kind of evidence would you accept to acknowledge that the world is as we've been told? I would acknowledge... It, it is, as we've been told, if I were shown irrefutable evidence, one, a curvature, as in um, curvature from high enough altitude brought to us by footage that's not presented to us from NASA or any of the existing space agencies. It's got to come from somebody that I consider to be impartial. Uh, barring that, I would like to see maybe contiguous ISS transits on the same night across multiple locations. That would be irrefutable. That would prove orbit. But... Uh, right now, I do not find the evidence compelling or satisfying, and uh, the lack of footage of a globe in space rotating is also troublesome. And then we're shown things like Starman by SpaceX, and I see that as just an insult to our intelligence. That can't be real. Okay, well, let's talk about Starman, and because um, that, that's quite an interesting topic, you know, a car in space. Well, um, it, it's cool whether you believe it or not, but um, why don't you think that's possible? It's not that I don't think it's um, impossible. I think that what we've been shown, though, is clearly staged. And there were a couple tells in the presentation. So it just looks to me like we were meant to accept it as real because maybe people haven't always been this critical with what they're shown from outer space. And also, when I look at the thing, it, uh, there are a few things that bother me. One, there are these little bits of what appear to be bubbles accelerating vertically in front of them the whole time. I'm told it's space dust. I have a problem with that. And then, uh, two, I have a problem with just how perfectly stable and level it is. There's no wobble. And we don't see anything of the Earth other than just blue. It's like planet water. Uh, okay, well, in regards to the wobble, you mean, like, from the, the camera's point of view, you don't see the car, like, shaking and stuff? I think it's just way too smooth, too perfect, well, uh, maybe a little, a little too curated to be real. I think it should be flipping, there should be some rotation, something. 
Well, with the cameras, they you know they were bolted onto the car with, with a frame. So you know, in in relation to the the car, the camera is always going to have a steady view. Um. Uh, in in regards to the planet being just water, I mean that's probably just because that was what it was over at the time. Um, do you deny that the uh, the physics are possible for us to have put that up there at all? Okay, I'll say this. I'll say that the whole system is internally consistent, and if it's all real, if the ball is what they say, if heliocentrism is what they say, then yeah, that would be hypothetically possible. But right now, I consider low Earth orbit to just be hypothetical. I don't believe that there's anything in low Earth orbit. And I don't think that there's any technology we're using right now that requires orbiting uh, infrastructure up there. Dangling, sure. High altitude, sure. But orbiting, no. Okay. Um, I suppose it all comes down to uh, talking about the lie, really, in a discussion like this. Um, one thing I always wanted to ask you is, who do you think is in on the truth? If the truth is that the Earth is flat, who are the people that actually know this? That's a very good question. It's an excellent, it's a, it's an excellent question because it, the whole thing about flat Earth, the problem is it does presuppose a conspiracy. This couldn't be an accident. It could not be an omission. It's not that nobody noticed. If it is flat, then this is a deliberate multi-century deception, which is a pretty huge claim, and I understand that. So if it is the case, the people in the know would be uh, people high up in government and military on a need-to-know basis. Um, and it would also be uh, pretty much a military secret. And it could also be, I mean, if you think about it, it might also be the, the uh, secret itself could be something handed down through the secret societies. I don't know if you believe in that stuff, but I'm just saying, you know the military, you have security clearances the higher up you go. That's, yeah. a, that's a secret society in effect. And so I'm saying, yeah, secret societies have always been around. And so, yeah, this whole theory does presuppose something. I can't say who. I wouldn't point out a certain group or tribe. or I think that's all um, red herring. But I think we're in a, uh, a system that has an elite technocratic class that employs this. They distort our history to keep us... Um, more or less enslaved, and I think they distort our cartography the same way and our cosmography. So, um, how far do you think the conspiracy would have to go? Um, like, like, how many people would have to know this? You say, like, uh, high up people in need to know basis in the government, but um, what about uh, pilots uh, and air traffic controllers that work with technology that, you know, we say relies on globe physics? Are, are they in on the conspiracy as well, or do they? Do pilots just fly assuming they are flying on a ball, or you know, are, are they lying to everybody as well? Right, I know what you mean. I hear this argument a lot. Like nine eleven couldn't be a conspiracy. Apollo eleven couldn't be because too many people would know. You got four hundred thousand contractors with the moon landing, and so I think if you break it down as far as compartmentalizing it. Um, the people who actually interface with the ball itself, like pilots don't even think about curve. I mean, we're too small to even think about it. It's out of sight, out of mind. I don't think it would require that many people. And there could easily be false explanations for what's in Antarctica, why we don't go over there. I wouldn't assume a silly ice wall, but I don't necessarily assume it's um, what we've been told. Okay. Um, so about Antarctica, you, you say it's not an ice wall. Uh, do you think we've been to Antarctica? Uh, do do you think what um, you know the, the you you have the the photo op South Pole that has to be kind of moved every now and then to to stay in alignment and everything? Is that a real thing, or is there no such thing as this as Antarctica at all? That's a good question. It could be one of two things, in my opinion. Um, it could be perfectly reasonable to think that there is a continent, the shape and look of Antarctica, where they say. I'm just suggesting that if it's flat, then that's just one part of a perimeter. There could be land all around, and so we're given the misapprehension that that continent is at the bottom of a ball. I'm saying here that the whole idea of giving us a false model of a 25,000-mile circumference ball is to hide land and hide resources. That's what I think the bottom line is. Okay. I don't think that's a religious thing. I don't think it's God or Satan. I think it's simply a resources and land and a technocratic elite 
uh, keeping us in a state of uh, relative uh, disempowerment. So um, what happens if people want to go to Antarctica? Uh, you know, what would happen, for instance, if somebody was in, in a boat on their own and just headed out towards Antarctica? Would they be stopped by some kind of elite military force? No, I think that's ludicrous. It would be impossible to manage such a thing. And the idea, of, I mean, I hear this from, I, I often ask flat earthers, and they get really mad at this. I say, where is the edge? And they act like it's a provocation. And they'll say, oh, you can't go, you'll get shot. And I think that's just a way to avoid the topic. And, you know, I think that um, if you wanted to go, yeah, you could book a trip and you could go. I just don't know how curated it is. And I'm saying something like this of this magnitude to be uncovered would require a great deal of public interest. That's the reason why we got behind the research flat earth billboard. We didn't say it is flat, believe us. We said research it, thinking if this piques the interest of enough people, somebody somewhere might know something that can make this go somewhere and reveal it one way or the other. But all we get from NASA, all we get from the other side is ridicule and a little bit of mockery. They never really show us anything that I think is satisfying. Okay, so um, keeping on talking about Antarctica, what about the, the recent people that have crossed Antarctica um, at, you know, and, and have photos and video of them doing it? Uh, is that all faked as well? I hate to say it, but you know, we're in the age of deep, deep fakes. We all know about deep fakes, and mm -hmm. I think we are deep faked on Apollo 11, and it'd be just as easy to deep fake us about Antarctica. They could take pictures and say, look at me, I'm on the rings of Saturn. And what are you going to do, believe them or not? It's like, it depends on how much you trust them. And so... I just think we cannot trust photos anymore, especially if their entire objective is holding up a deception. So I have to rule out photos as evidence in itself. Same with video. Okay. Um, so uh, the, do you know of the uh, One More Orbit team that did the pole-to-pole -pole flight recently? Yeah, I actually called and I, I'm, I'm actually trying to get an interview with Colonel Bird about that. I watched that. The One More Orbit they did on the 50th anniversary of the Apollo and this sounds bad, because I was hoping they would just get on a plane and make a big loop, but it looked like they were in, like on a stage. And you didn't even see out the window. You saw Vert sitting there joking, and then he'd have his camera and take a picture out the window. I didn't get the impression these guys were even in air. I'm sorry, but that thing looked fake. Okay. And it's just so lazy of them to fake something like that. All right, so again, it comes down to they're, they're lying to us, and it's all being orchestrated. All right. So I suppose the, the question that, that I have to ask is, is there any evidence for this, like actual hard evidence that, that, that anyone can actually go and find to show that what you're saying might be a reality? Because, uh, you know, I've spoken to a lot of flat earthers and no one has ever actually shown me any positive evidence. There's always a lot of, um, well, I don't think this could be true or uh, I think they're lying to us because of this, but is there actually any physical evidence of the Earth being a, a plane? Right, right. That's a good question, um, is there? Because you're right. You know, when you talk about extraordinary claims, whoever's making the claim owns that burden of proof, and a lot of flat earthers are like, oh, put it on them because the globe is so extraordinary. But I'm saying, no, after this long, it's so entrenched, it's really up to us. And so the best I can do, uh, what I find compelling personally, is I look at the ISS blooper reel. That I find very compelling. That's one. Two, if you look at the European Space Agency's footage of the Earth from space, they have a shadow under the ISS that shouldn't be there. That's hilarious, and it's a mistake. And they do it on multiple takes. So I would say look at the ISS footage hypercritically if you okay. want to think, if you want to find out if there's anything to what I'm saying here. So, um, again, that comes down to the difference between kind of false and positive evidence. What you've just given me is uh, more, well, the ISS is, is possibly fake. Therefore, the Earth could be flat rather than an actual bit of evidence for the Earth being flat. Uh, I understand that you, that you don't believe that NASA are telling you the truth uh, and probably all other space agencies. Um, so let's just take that as a given that, that's the, that the, that is your stance. So knowing that, do you actually have any positive evidence for the Earth being flat? I have one for you. Um, okay. I was out, I was in the military for um, a few years after uh, high school, and I was with air defense artillery. And there was one day where we were out at White Sands, New Mexico, and <clears> they were using these uh, radars, this is for the Patriot missile system, and they were painting targets 100 miles away. 
And I remember thinking nothing of the distance. And we're talking about targets on the ground. Can't talk about this. It's actually, this is even what I told you now. I don't have the security clearance to know it. I overheard it because I was attached to a unit as an NBC guy. And so I didn't even think about this little conversation I overheard until I heard somebody talking about rail guns. And I'm like, I can't find any videos of rail guns shooting 100 miles on a level trajectory, but Popular Mechanics says they can do it. But I do specifically recall people in ADA, Air Defense Artillery, talking about painting targets 100 miles across a flat level ground. And nowhere are they talking about a parabolic arc. So when I hear this, I'm thinking, well, this is why the public doesn't know. You asked earlier how many people would know. Tens of thousands of people know it's flat because they've experienced it, but they don't know that they know it. And I'm saying anybody who's ever done air defense artillery, who's worked at those distances in these bases, know that they're not dealing with a ball, um, at least not one with appreciable curve at 100 miles. So that's one thing I could say that would point to evidence. But the problem, like I said, the people who have the evidence are probably sworn to secrecy. Right. OK, so there really isn't any hard kind of circumstantial empirical evidence that you could point me to that you know, that anyone could, could could go and find. Um, so, OK, there is there is. Here's one. Like, the thing is, everything that we point to as ob as obvious proof that we're on a flat stationary plane and that the lights above us are local and move, anything we can point to already has a counter explanation. So people will say, well, you see different constellations in the northern and southern hemispheres because we're on a ball and it's being obscured by the curve. And I'm saying, or we're on a flat plane and the stars are close and local. So um, a lot of this is built upon assumptions. And so um, even uh, Aristosthenes, that experiment about measuring the shadows and the angles of the shadows from the sun on the same day, 500 miles apart, was based on what? Assum assuming a ball, measuring a ball. But what if you took the same measurements and you didn't assume it was a ball? Well, they kind of already knew that it was a ball uh, and it was just using the angles that then gave them the circumference. So I suppose, yes, to do that experiment with the two points, you would have to um, assume it was a ball. But uh, there's a lot more that can now show us, you know, we're, we're 2,500 years later than Eratosthenes. And we, we've got the technology now to, to actually measure these things. And I know you're not going to accept all the stuff from from space, but um, you know, photography on the ground can, can show that we are on a curve. When you look at things like Mount Rainier in the distance being smaller than the mountains in front of it when it's actually bigger, you know, showing that we are on a, on a curve, um, you know, I've, I've never, you know, I can I could point to a thousand pictures that aren't from space that show that we have a curve that is visible and there's an effect to the curve but i've never ever seen anything from any flat earther that is positive evidence of this here is a picture of the flat earth well the one thing we have going for us luckily is uh, the science channel is backing mad mike hughes homemade astronauts and they've got a rock tomb built, and this is a flat earther who is going to the Kármán line using a combination of a balloon and a rocket. And he's going to get high enough, whether he reaches 60 miles or even half that, the footage he gets is going to have to be taken seriously by everybody on both sides if they're going to be honest and flat earthers won't be able to deny it if it shows a big fat curve. Mm -hmm. I mean, props to Mad Mike Hughes. Um, the guy's built his own rocket out of a boiler, so... Uh, the guy may be a, uh, a flat earther, but, you know, that, that's that's pretty cool. And the fact that, you know, he is going to try and actually get some evidence, which is great. So if that came up and he showed that there was a big curve, would that change your mind? Would, is, would that be enough to convince you that the earth is a globe? Oh, absolutely. Although what it wouldn't do is it wouldn't immediately cause me to think, OK, I was 100 percent wrong on everything I, I called out on ISS. Because then, then I would still have to ask myself, then why is the space station faking stuff? Because they still are faking footage, which would lead, lead me to think that, well, maybe the Earth is a ball, but they're hiding land, or they're hiding the fact that Antarctica is a lush paradise. Like, there's something they're hiding if they're deceiving us all the time with these productions they're giving us from the space companies. And I do have a conspiracy theory about this. I do actually think that the space program is really nothing more then a way for all the nations of the world to get everybody to march lockstep with radical environmentalism. And I think that's the case. 
You went, look at all the right-wingers who voted for Trump thinking he's a small government nationalist, and he brings them Space Force. So I think the space program space is force. a ruse anyway. Well, see, the big problem with that is that you have to assume that all the governments are colluding together. And, you know, that, that's just something that I don't see as possible. Um, you know, do, do you think that countries that are typically hostile, USA and China, they don't exactly have a, a friendly relationship. Are they actually in secret talks with each other and, you know, secretly ruling the world from some kind of shady organization? That's what I'm saying that might sound controversial to you. I think that the nations of the world are actually in a massive conspiracy against the populations. Whoever runs these places owns these places. I don't think that Russia and America were ever in a space race. I think it's always been a ruse to get the capitalists to fall into this idea of this new utopian communist worker's paradise, which is all being couched in this Jetsons-like window dressing, a.k.a. the space program. So, yeah, it worked. Look how many capitalists are willing to give up their luxury, their wealth, their meat, to go farm potatoes on Mars. This has been a communist plot from day one. That's my theory. And so, yeah, I do think that any nation that has part of the space program that adopts it, like Iran, now they have their own space program, anybody who does that, I think they fall in lockstep with this universal deception. Okay, so the, you know, the recent launch from India, um, that, that was all part of the hoax as well. So and anything that is to do with space is all part of the hoax from any nation. Yes, I, I, I believe that outer space, uh, as it's been described to us, is really just a utopian vision. It's the new version of heaven that, you know, Rome used to have people on this idea of heaven that we're trying to get to. Everyone's competing over who has the right version. Well, outer space is the new universal heaven for the one world order religion, which is the space program. That's my contention here. And they're all working together. And when you look at an obelisk, you make, I mean, a rocket, you're looking at an obelisk, in my view. You're looking at Rome. You're looking at really the universal religion and a new heaven that the atheists found palatable. I mean, you're probably an atheist and you fear God more than the God-fearing people because you believe we're in the end times if you believe in global warming and imminent asteroid strike. <laughs> well, um, yes, I'm an atheist, uh, although I will say I will never be able to disprove God. And I don't think anyone could ever disprove that there is a God. Um, but I also don't think that the acceptance or um, knowledge of there being a God takes away the physical laws that we know and see every day. Um, you say that outer space isn't real. So um, I would have to ask you, why is there a pressure gradient? And the reason I ask that question is that because we know there's a pressure gradient, then surely that would mean that the pressure gradient would go all the way to zero, which would be outer space. Right. Yeah, actually, I know what you mean. Outer space, like they used to call it thin air. And yeah, of course, as a pressure gradient, you go up higher and higher, it's going to be thinner. And yeah, that's technically, quote, outer space. I just think that what we've been sold as outer space, what's been packaged for us with generations of science fiction and pseudoscience and mysticism pretending to be science and cosmo uh, cosmology, I think a lot of this stuff is just fiction. So our construct of space is a fiction. Uh, what is up there, I don't know. I don't think it goes out for trillions of light years. I don't believe in exoplanets. I don't believe in uh, black holes or any of this stuff. I don't really think that beyond our range of vision, there is this magical paradise full of unlimited resources. I don't think that mankind's future is up there. And um, outer space, I think, is really, like I said, it's a false vision. I think it's a utopian thing. I think it's heaven. Okay. So um, do you... Do you prescribe to the we're in an enclosed system thing or uh, are you accepting of the fact that there could be a point where there's zero atmosphere, but it's just not what we've been told? I am accepting of it. And if it is the case, then what is up, whatever is up there. Um, now, it doesn't necessarily mean that there'd be orbit. That's what I don't know yet. And as far as there being an enclosure, I think it's premature to say uh, anybody who says there's a dome. I'm like, where the hell are they getting that from? Because if you're going to say there's a dome, like Mark Sargent, for example, you're taking your concept from the Bible. And that concept also includes a footstool that the dome sits on. So I can't, I can't say, you know, there's an enclosure. And if there is, saying it's a dome also presupposes that it arcs down and there's an edge somewhere. And I can't even assume that. that that's so, what I no, was going I mean, to, to, to say is if there is a dome, how come there's never been any reports of anyone 
you know, getting to the point where the dome meets the ground. Um, okay. Exactly, exactly. And, and I, I call them edifos. Uh, ask any flat earther who says there's a dome, show me the dome, where's the dome? Show me the spot where all the spent SpaceX rockets are piled up at the edge. And none of them want to go there. They're not even interested in the topic because they see it as you challenging their biblical faith. So, no, I think the dome was put there for religious people to co-opt this um, uh, new level of skepticism against what could be a whole lot of pseudoscience. The Bible has nothing to do with flat earth. Okay, so what happens when NASA or SpaceX or anyone, they launch a rocket up and you see it go into space and... Uh, I could show you videos from Red's Rhetorics where um, you can see the gas escaping out of the back, getting to a point th that it shows you that the rocket is in a vacuum. What are they doing with those rockets? Have, ha have okay. they... Sorry, yeah, this is my problem with this. Okay, so recently there was a Soyuz supply rocket went up to go deliver some you know, monkey costumes, guitars, and uh, pizza, whatever, to the space station. And... Uh, one of the guys on the space station did a time lapse of that rocket, from the Soyuz rocket, going from Earth to space. And you could see it on a time lapse. It goes on the ground, and you can see a little explosion as it goes into space. And it looks like it's something out of a video game. And I'm kind of face palming here because there was no gravity tilt. It went perpendicular from Earth to the space. When we know that these rockets arc, and then they fall into orbit, it didn't do that on the time lapse. So I'm just saying, I don't trust any of this footage they give us because I think it's all done in a production studio. Okay, so it's all done in the production studio. What about when, for instance, the ISS does, uh, you know, a two hour long live stream of people on board floating, showing you around the compartments with equipment floating, liquid floating. How do they do that in real time? I've seen that, and I think what they do with the space station is movie magic. I think what got us to the moon is movie magic. It could easily be harnesses, but these days it could be almost anything. Uh, it could also be parabolic flights for short bursts. I think they've done that before. I noticed they don't have a long, lot of long-haired women up there anymore because people noticed all the hairspray. Uh, so when it comes to the ISS, I think things eminently debunkable in a dozen different ways. I think it's foolish. And I think they're embarrassed by it, and they want to bring it down so they can replace it with something with better special effects. Uh, see, um, I, I honestly don't see how they could do a, a live feed for that long with people, you know, floating and equipment floating and everything. Um, say it was just 30 seconds or whatever, it could be on a parabolic flight. But when you have a live feed where they're interacting with, with people that are watching the live feed, and it's going on for a long, long, long time, shows that they have to be in some kind of microgravity environment. Well, one of the things I look at is, and in fact, this is kind of funny. I was noticing that many of the times they look like they're dangling like characters in that movie Inception, like they've got harnesses on their back. And I've always noticed that with Scott Kelly, that there's a thickness around his neck. He almost looked like he was hanging upside down from like a, a, a monkey, a, what do you call it, monkey bars. You know, like, it's like, why does he look so livid? Anyway, the next day I got this article on Space News where they were talking about how astronauts on the ISS have a lot of blood in their heads because they're floating around. And it was almost like they were doing damage control because we're calling it out that these people are dangling like spiders against the green screen background. That's what I'm saying. It doesn't look like they're actually in outer space to me. I don't find the footage compelling whatsoever. Um, I don't think that it's a even likely that you can find a tour that they don't have it chopped up into short little bursts. They did the longest Hail Mary pass ever during the Super Bowl before last, so they threw a, a football that went from one end to the other. There were four splices in there. Why do they have to splice it? If they had showed me a football going the whole distance, I would have said, okay, well, that would be <clears> hard to fake. <throat> okay, so um, can you see the screen? Uh, yes, that would be, right. uh, was it Tim yeah. Peak? Yeah, so... What do you think is happening here? Do you think this is, um, he's doing this for some kind of cinematography reason? Because uh, I've had this brought up with a lot of flat earthers. What, what do you think is going on in this shot here? I'm familiar with this shot, and people will say, they'll look at that, and they'll say that's some type of um, blue screen that they're using. And uh, that's not what that is. Um, what he's doing here, though, is, yeah, he's simulating space, and he's doing some type of experiments with objects in simulated space. Um, I don't believe he's in this outer space zero-G environment. 
And when I look at the way that they move on the ISS, it looks nothing like the way people move in parabolic flights. They, they're super stiff. I mean, have you ever looked at some of the somersaults these guys do when they don't get tangled up in their own harnesses? Yeah, um, and parabolic flights, they're not exactly the most stable of things. But when you're on the ISS, it's a constant rate of, um, you know, of, of acceleration towards the ground because, you know, that's what an orbit is. They are constantly accelerating. They're in free fall. They're, they're always accelerating towards the ground, but they are missing the ground and you know, missing the Earth and constantly going around, which is why they're always in free fall. Um, uh, so, you know, that, that's a lot smoother than when you're on like a parabolic flight and you're being chucked around. Uh, I'm glad that you uh, agreed that this isn't some kind of chroma key screen because um, so many flat earthers try and say that this is a chroma key screen and I use green screen all the time and there is absolutely no way that you'd be able to use that as any kind of green screen chroma key to remove what's happening. It, the, the white squares would make it a lot harder than, than it would need to be. Um, yeah, that's a bit of um, cognitive bias there. A lot of times people will reach for things and just try to grab as many things as they possibly can, grab all 200 proofs of Robotham. And I don't think that's the right approach. Uh, so now um, with regards to the ISS, uh, the yeah. ISS transits are the, one of the things that really got me to question this thing. Because I do a lot of, or I used to do a lot of video editing. I do a lot of photo work. And I was, I've been watching Jaren's ISS transits. And when I saw it, I thought, wait a minute. This has got to be a joke. That is, I thought he was pulling a joke on the flat earthers and everybody. Like, there's no way you can have that much detail on an object 272 miles away moving at 17K. Now, I know it's relative on the speed, but there was zero motion blur, way too much detail. And so I actually looked at this closely, and I really have a hard time believing that any of the ISS transits are real. Even ones like from Red's Rhetoric uh, and Astronomy Live, um, I'm, I'm sure you've seen those. I mean, they're, they're the most probably some of the most famous and um astronomy live and red's rhetoric actually managed to use their transits of the iss to calculate its distance and speed and just using the the pictures that they took uh you know and looking at the distance they were apart they actually they managed to get the correct speed and altitude of the iss and when things like that match up to what we're being told it it just backs up the um you know it, things are as we've been told Right, exactly. And so what it looked like to me is, and, and I hate to say it, you know, but it looks like these guys and Jaren, and this is just my opinion, and again, you know I have a certain conspiratorial bias about this thing being a deliberate deception. They look like low-level agents perpetrating a deception by all faking the ISS transits to maintain the illusion of low Earth orbit. And coming from Jaren as an authority, now all of Jaren's followers believe that there's an object up there. They just don't want to admit it's the ISS. And I'm saying, hey, you guys, you don't have any proof there's an object up there other than an insert shot that looks phony. And the fact that it was just as phony as Red's and the other guys tells me they're all in on it. They're all okay. pretty much, I think, in a conspiracy against reality. Have you ever uh, tried to film it yourself? I have, and I have through a couple of people on my Discord server. And one of the issues I have is this. A friend of mine was pointing out there's a news article, I think it was in New York, and they said that ISS is going to be visible for 647 seconds. So you're, you're looking at, this thing's up there for more than 10 minutes. And I'm like, wait, there's no way you should see it for 10 minutes if it's going five miles a second, unless you're seeing it from, what, 1,500 miles one way, 1,500 the other way. And there's no way that we can see 3,000 miles of sky at the 300-mile altitude mark. So it took too long to pass over. This is a 10-minute ISS transit. Look it up. There's no reason why you would see a light for 10 minutes. Not the speed that it's going. Not if it anticipates going around the world in 90 minutes. Sky and how much of that the, the ISS would be passing over. I don't think that would be a stretch to think that, that that's how it should be. Um, so Jaron, like you said, has managed to get his own transit um, at you, are you saying that he's part of the conspiracy to lie about things? Uh, not just Jaron, but Jaron and Globusters deep inside the rabbit hole, that entire clique, uh, even uh, Nathan Thompson, I hate to say it, all these guys stand by it. They swear by it, and they say it's real. And I'm saying that's just an insert shot. You see Jaron put his phone up, 
And then he says, okay, three, two, one. He times it, and then bam, it's an insert shot. And it's like, you don't know what he did. It's just like when NASA cuts from the rocket disappearing from your line of sight, you can't see it anymore, and then they cut to space. Well, in between that cut, that's where the deception is. And so, yeah, I, I had to walk away from this saying, hey, all these big community um, leaders and thought leaders in the Flat Earth community are actually secretly working for the other side. Okay, so um, who are the actual Flat Earthers? Well, given that the Flat Earth Society is obviously controlled, a controlled narrative, very biblical, they believe in a dome, and yet they still believe in outer space, they believe in climate change, which is also a huge contradiction. Uh, Mark Sargent believes in climate change, huge contradiction, because the same people who are telling you about climate change are the ones reporting every day, hey, you're on a ball today. So that's a huge contradiction. But um, as far as the only legitimate ones are the people who are uh, looking into it for themselves, who don't have an agenda, a religious agenda, or an agenda somehow to reinforce the idea of low Earth orbit and that we're on a ball. And that's what it looks like Globusters and Jaren are actually doing under the disguise. It's called controlled opposition. Uh, Lenin talked about this. It's just an old thing. Okay, so the, the main flat earthers within the current movement are controlled opposition. Um, what about me? Um, why do you think I do what I do? I think you do what you do because you legitimately trust what you've been told and you think it's real and you see what we're doing as an affront, if not possibly dangerous. I've seen, I'm not sure if you think this, and I wanted to ask you, do you think that people have the right to be this wrong, or do you think it's a danger to society? Like, do you think society needs to intervene at some point yeah. when people well, are what you think to be wrong? There's, there's being wrong, and then there is being so wrong that you have to think that everyone is lying to you. And my big problem with Flat Earth is that um, to believe that the Earth is flat, like you said, everybody has to be lying to you or or at least being lied to so to to for a child to come across that kind of influence i think that will skew their mind for for the rest of their life because if they think that everyone's lying to them then they're never going to trust anyone and it can confuse and ruin a young mind and when it's going against what what education says and when it's going against what you can even find out for yourself, I do think there comes a point where it can be dangerous to um, the vulnerable and maybe less intelligent members of society that would not know any better. I'm, a, I'm with you on that. Like, okay, I don't think it's right to try to teach kids. Like, Eric Dubay has a book out right now, right, where he's teaching kids about flat earth. And, like, this is the wrong guy to do it. Uh, for a number of reasons, not just his ethnic fascism and all that stuff, but uh, that that guy put out a book for children thinking, I guess what, to try to get them to start questioning it now, and they don't have enough information. Like, this is something for adults. But at the same, by the same token, I don't think that students or kids in schools should be taught that global warming is a fact. I don't think that they should be terrorized with these school shooter drills. I think school shooter drills are a form of terrorism by the state against the kids. And I think it's based on these school shootings, which I'm not going to get into it into your channel. And this is a very, very yes, sensitive topic. I I'm just that. saying, I don't trust the media, and I don't trust the space media. I don't trust the news down on the ground or above. And I think brainwashing is fundamentally wrong. So yeah, I'm with you on that. Brainwashing, the information is dangerous. And I'm saying here is that you know, like a lot of information can be dangerous and radicalizing for people. And I think that the radicals who believe in global warming are way more dangerous than the flat earthers who say that the Earth's flat. Okay, right. So um, I think I'd like to talk to you about some of the reasons why I think that the Earth is round uh, and see what you think about it. And one of the main things is that I know that we are spinning. I know that the Earth is rotating. Um, it's very easy to figure out that the Earth is rotating because there's so many things that happen because the Earth is rotating, like Coriolis force, like the Eotvos force. Um, you know, the pendulum effect, all, all these things quite clearly show the physics of us being on a rotating object. Um, so how do you respond to things? I mean, obviously, you know, Bob did the, the, the fiber optic gyro thing, um, but I know you think he's controlled opposition. But regardless of that, 
fiber optic gyros do show what Bob said. They do show that the Earth has a 15 degree per hour drift. So why do all these things work out to show that the Earth is rotating if, if it's not? Right, well, the only explanation for that would be that they're measuring something other than movement of the Earth, which would imply that there's a 15 degree movement in something, which could be what um, I think they would call it the ether. I don't know specifically. So my answer is, I don't know. I need to invest, I would need to, um, because look, the only explanation is one Bob gave ether, which isn't even included, you know, in our modern scientific paradigm. So what are you gonna, what are you gonna do? You're gonna trust the oracle in the box? And so I look at this gyro thing as, I don't think we should make an argument from laser gyro. I think we should just wait until one of these space agencies can just take a picture of the Earth on their iPhone and show it spinning, instead of all these CGI rendered obvious phonies. Well, the, the thing is about that is that it's spinning at 15 degrees per hour, which you know, you're not going to see from just taking a, a little picture. I mean, you can see the, the, the the earth that I've got spinning behind me, right? You know, the, the earth is spinning so much slower than that. I think I've set that to like 400 times, maybe 4,000 times faster than the earth is actually spinning. Um, so for you to say you want to just see a video of the earth spinning, you would have to watch 24 hours to see the earth rotate just once. Which, which is okay, what- Yeah, which, that, that's, a, that's a fair point. That's a fair point. Which is why so we- slow have things like the fiber optic gyro and the Sagnac effect. Do you understand how a fiber optic gyro measures what it does? Oh, why don't you explain it? Clarify for me. Okay, right. Let me just get a video up um, that's a very good explanation and I'll talk you through it. So, all right. And, when they, a... look, and what I would expect to see, uh, really quick here, yep. um, why couldn't and they could just time lapse a 24 hour spinning um, ball and the I mean, clouds should reflect a 24-hour change. But anyway, go ahead and explain the gyro. Okay, right. So um, now what a fiber optic gyro does essentially is splits light into two paths, okay? So uh, one path is the blue, one path is the red. Um, and if the gyro is not moving, when the light goes round, it's going to take the same amount of time to go round both of the paths. So when it recombines like this, uh, you wouldn't see any kind of interference pattern. But if the gyro is rotating like this, uh, that literally makes one of the paths the light has to travel shorter, which means that when it gets back to the point that the light recombines, the, the light waves would be out of sync with each other and you would get an interference pattern showing. Now, that's how the fiber optic gyro would measure a 15 degree drift because the gyro itself would literally be moving, making one of the paths for the light shorter. And it's not only the 15 degree per hour drift that it would register. If you left it for like 365 days, um, it, it would literally show you an entire rotation around the sun as well. It would register that drift. But obviously that's about one degree a day, so it'd be a lot harder to see that. But seeing the 15 degrees per hour because of this Sagnac effect is very easy. And modern aircraft have three of these, one to measure pitch, one to measure yaw, one to measure roll, because they are so precise in measuring the movement of what they're actually on. Okay, let me ask a question then. So um, what do you think of Bob's explanation here uh, that it's the ether it's measuring? If there were such a thing as the ether, just hypothetically, and we're um, on a flat stationary plane and we're moving, would it react with that gyro in the same way? No, uh, th there's a gyro like that doesn't um, have any kind of outside influence. It, it, it doesn't know what's going on outside of the gyro at all. Um, it is literally just, you know, measuring the movement of the gyro itself and therefore the thing it is attached to. Um, Bob tries to use the fact that, um, well, the, the ether has this kind of tor toroidal spin coming down that, that's at 15 degrees per hour that's what it's what what it registers but light would not be affected by and whatever the ether is in that way because it, it's not an electromagnetic field or anything like we could we could be able to register that it's it's nothing that could ever affect the light in that gyro in the way 
you know, the, they are saying, because it would literally have to be slowing down the light for one of the paths rather than the path itself becoming shorter or longer. So um, when Nathan Thompson, for instance, relates it to a feral cell, he really has no idea what he's talking about. So, um, no, I honestly, even if the ether was a thing, which it's really not, Mike Morley clearly showed that, I, you know, I don't think it would be able to pick up my, the, the heavenly energies, as Bob said. Interesting. Okay, so I don't have enough information about that particular tool to know if I can uh, reliably make my determination based on that alone. I don't think that laser tests are going to be effective. There are too many things that would mitigate that being an effective I, way I agree. for I, ambiguous lack. I honestly think that laser yeah, tests that. are kind of useless because we all know that, you know, light is affected by the atmosphere and, you know, things can refract. So it's very hard to have a, a laser test to actually show you what you want it to show you because you could say, oh, yes, it's reaching that point. But then we could say, well, it's actually curving with the Earth. So um, I think Mick West did a very good video on saying why laser tests are actually not very reliable, uh, which is why for me it comes down to things like this that actually show the physical rotation of the earth um and do you know what the pendulum effect is yeah okay like so for example you take the yeah the pendulum and people make claims you can tell where you are in the world based on its movement Absolutely. Uh, i don't know if i think that is um viable it looks like it could be gamed it looks a little too um like the thing about water going down the drain or coralial spec do you think that snipers take the rotation of the earth into account for long well, distance shots snipers very rarely shoot over a kilometer um and uh i mean the, the u.s military uh, the u.s marine corps sniper manual doesn't go over a thousand kilometers and i don't think uh, sorry one kilometer uh, and, and i don't think for kind of that length you would need to take the coriolis into account um i have had snipers tell me that for longer shots yes they do have to take it into account um but we know for a fact that um ballistics you know uh, have to take it into account you know, um the the famous story of uh, during the world war where the british were shooting their artillery and they'd taken into account for what they thought was the coriolis force but they ended up being twice as far from the targets as they were supposed to be and that's because the the equipment was literally just designed to work in the, the one hemisphere so they had to kind of reverse the calculations to actually get it right all these things uh, add up to that we know the coriolis force is real um however you said about water going down the drain the, that's that's kind of an urban myth and the coriolis force is very little to do with which way the water goes down a drain I mean, um, but isn't it interesting how many of these urban myths are taught yeah. in schools at the elementary level? And then when you talk about flat earth, the first thing people say is, hey, my friend's in Australia where he's upside down and the water goes the opposite way. And these things get passed on. And then you get Jimmy Kimmel, who says that he can look at the horizon and he can see it bend. So I don't see people fact checking what they've originally been taught. So no. right or wrong, at least flat earthers are going through this stuff and pouring through it. I have a question for you. Do you mm -hmm. think it's a contradiction? that the moon is both tidally, tidally locked to the earth and also said to have its own axial rotation? No, because that's kind of what tidal locking is. The axial rotation of the earth, uh, of the moon, um, matches the um, rotation of the earth. So that means that the, by the time the moon does one full rotation, it's also done a rotation of the earth. Um, meaning that the face always stays towards the earth and that's simply to do with um gravity pushing and pulling so um if you uh, imagine the moon spinning uh, rotating a lot faster than it is and going around the earth the the gravitational forces are going to be trying to slow down that spin uh, and then it gets to a point where it's in equilibrium with the rotation of the, the the moon around its own axis and the rotation of the moon around the earth and that's just a natural equilibrium of the gravitational forces acting on it yeah I, I understand that how it's described as synchronous rotation and so i'm looking very closely at the moon and what we're told and what it's supposed to be and how it's supposed to work and i find it very problematic that it's facing always towards us and i can understand if it was locked and its face was basically um locked to us but the fact that they say it's rotating and we 
never see the back of it. And they say, it's, oh, it's just because of our relative position to the Earth. It's almost too perfect to believe. I understand that's an argument from incredulity, but I find that's very hard to believe. And I hope Thing they're is, right. It's not just our moon. Um, you, you can look at all the other moons in the solar system, and I'm, you know, they're all tightly locked as well. Uh, you know, if, with a decent telescope, you can look at the moons of Jupiter uh, and you know, observe these things for yourself. You know, a, a moon being tidally locked isn't an abnormal thing. Um, and when you actually look into the reasons why it happens, based on the heliocentric model, it has to happen. Okay, then I got another question. So the Earth is an oblate spheroid. I understand it's so uh, minutely oblate you can't see it. Mm -hmm. But the idea is that it's spinning, so it's kind of like hand toss pizza. It's getting chubbier in the middle as it spins. How come we don't have any pictures of oblate planets anywhere? The only one that we're told is oblate is the Earth, and yet our imagery of it is all very spherical, spherical as a ping pong ball. Where are all the oblate planets? Well, um, again, the, the same reason why our planet is only very slightly oblate. You, you would have to assume that other planets would only have a very you know, slight oblateness. Um, we, we don't really see planets spinning like a whirling top. Uh, so you would have to think that the centrifugal forces are never there to make that actually happen. Um, I don't know what would happen if there was a planet spinning, you know, you know, so fast that it, it would flatten itself out. I'm not I'm not sure. But I think I could say with certainty that we've never observed a planet spinning fast enough for the oblateness to be that noticeable. OK, that's fair. A um, couple of the questions. One, there's no space dust. So if I get a little bit of a dust storm where I live, I can't see the mountain peaks eight miles away. And yet between Earth and the moon, quarter of a million miles, there's not enough dust to cloud up even a single star. Uh, between the Earth and Mars, there's millions of miles, yet there's no clouds at night in outer space blocking any stars. And for the amount of tonnage of debris up there and the amount of dust that's actually hitting the Earth every day, there ought to be some kind of cloud cover beyond our immediate atmosphere out there in space, at least um, occluding the stars here and there, and I never see it. I mean, the, the simple answer to that is space is massive, and there there isn't that you know, massive dust clouds just kind of rolling around in space. Um, um, I, I always think a good way to kind of put this into perspective is that if you look at the, the rings of, um, of Saturn, right, you, know, you, you would think that they're kind of a hard, tangible thing that is a ring. But no, there's like on average about a kilometer, uh, uh, you know, may, maybe more between kind of the objects that are in Saturn's rings. There's none, you know, it's not like a whole bunch of tightly packed things together that you could grab as one. It's just because it's so massive, it looks like they're closer together. And I suppose it's the same with space. Space is just so massive that any clouds of dust are going to be so diffuse that they're never really going to be an issue for us to see or deal with. I just figured after millions of miles, because the amount of dust in terms of like, the weight of dust, let's say there might be a ton of dust between me and that mountain peak eight miles away, but I would just think that it would aggregate and it would accumulate and at least once in a while we'd have a dark patch in the sky. I was told by spacenews.com that there is a dust moon orbiting the Earth between the Earth and the moon and it is 70 times wider than the moon and it could hypothetically black out the moon on any night. And yet I've never seen this dust moon. So I've, a lot of yeah, my I've never heard that comes from myself. not... I've, I've never seen a lot of the things they say are up there. Um, I mean, most of the things they say are up there. You can literally observe yourself with any commercial grade telescope. Um, but I think one thing I have to ask you is when we go to things like we are learning about gravitational waves and, and we're detecting gravitational waves with, with LIGO, uh, what is this all just keeping up the lie and just inventing more things to to keep the lie going you know what would be the point of investing all that money in creating LIGO if space isn't a real thing oh, have we lost him oh sorry about that yeah oh. the reason why i'm saying is uh because the idea of outer space is the linchpin that holds this whole false paradigm utopian vision together outer space is a utopian vision and I think that all the sciences are being perverted or curverted to fit this end. You know, there are physicists right now who say that the universe is flat 
right? They say it's a flat, infinite universe. I find a lot of people who they probably are legitimately um, with pure intentions, doing their work as they think they should be doing, but at some point, it goes from science into pseudoscience. Just like the reporters on the ground for the news media, they may be well-intentioned, thinking they're just reporting the news, but whoever runs the corporation has an ulterior motive. And so I'm saying there's a lot of good-natured people in all these different fields who are being misled. And I can tell you the astronauts are not being misled. If, if this thing is true, if the Earth is flat, every single astronaut is an actor through and through. Some of them are scuba divers and pilots, but they're actors, not space travelers. Okay. All right. So let's say um, I'm a kid growing up and I, I love space and I want to be an astronaut and I've worked really hard and I've got my degrees and I've gone through the NASA training program. At what point am I told that it's all fake and I'm not going to space? I think you're told when you're moving up through the ranks, you're going to be selected for certain things. There's a TV show in the UK called Space Cadets, and it describes the process of choosing the contestants for what was going to be a hoax. And they selected people who they knew would fall for it. They have various indicators. And five of the people on this craft believe they were in low Earth orbit for the duration of the TV show. So I think there's a lot of deception. I think it's a need-to-know basis, and I think that deception's the rule, not the... Um, ex exception here when it comes to the science is high up. I think the media, the, the government controlled media and the government controlled science are all in a conspiracy to hide the nature of the world that we're on. And I think that NASA is just a religion at this point. Okay. Um, so you, you know, there'd be no point in anyone actually trying to uh, go and become an astronaut then. I would say this. Okay, so if, let's say you wanted to become an astronaut. I would say, um, obviously, keep doing it. The skills you learn, everything's going to matter. But at some point, you're going to be entering into, um, you're going to have to enter into the realm of either being a dupe or one of the dupers. On the Space Cadet show, five of the people on deck were actors. The other five were the dupes. So it doesn't matter which side you're going to be on. If you're going to be a dupe, you're going to be a useful idiot your whole life. Uh, that's what you'll do. And I think the people who are holding up the deception are the ones who are selected, the ones who are willing to lie and deceive to gain an upper hand in life. <clears throat> it's okay. a criminal conspiracy if you think about it. Um, I mean, if you, if the Earth was flat, then yes, it would be a criminal conspiracy. But you know, there's so much evidence that says the Earth isn't flat. That's the thing. Um, I've talked to you about uh, ro rotation, and, and you kind of skipped over pendulums and. Uh, have you, there's a channel, a channel called the, the Gentleman Physicist that did this, and it's something I'm trying to recreate at the moment, where you can use a pendulum to kind of locate your position based on the amount of swing that the pendulum gives over a certain amount of time. Um, do you agree that pendulums can show the rotation of the Earth? Uh, what about Foucault's pendulum and things like that? You know, it all... Right, right. Well, I think I think Foucault's pendulum, I think the Cavendish experiment, I think these things are all just meant to uh, give an appeal to an authority, an appeal to tradition. I think that these are all just you know things that need to be tried out again. I don't think we should okay. cite experiments from 150. I don't think that we should have settled science. Like no, no, no a, absolutely, science and um, and, I, I, and that's one thing. Science isn't a settled thing. You know, our our, our knowledge is always increasing. Um, but when you say about the Cavendish, there is people that have, have done it recently. There's um, a, a global river called BM Furble, um, an absolute amazing guy. Everyone, please check out BM Furble's channel if one of my mods could put his link in the chat. And he has, he, he's, um, he lives in South Korea, and in his apartment, he has recreated his own Cavendish experiment. And the data shows that mass attracts mass. Um, so... There is evidence that mass attracts mass, and gravity is what we say it is. And the thing okay, so about some guy in South Korea in his apartment figured this out. See, like, look, if it's repeatable, so if we can get uh, people all across the planet to do it at the same time, repeatable. And this is what I said earlier. What would I what I would find compelling is if you could get ten or fifteen people on a single night to catch the same ISS transit and put that footage back to back, and make it contiguous, because there's no way you could refute that. Okay, um, I mean that, and maybe that's something that flat earthers should be trying to do, to disprove it once and for all. Uh, when when I say about being furable doing it in in his own apartment, 
that kind of says to me that it is a repeatable thing that anybody can do. I mean, there's no special equipment involved here. The guy's just managed to do it himself and over refinement, um, figure out the best way to actually measure the, the, the phenomenon of mass attracting mass. Um, and the reason why uh, I wanted to talk about gravity is because when we look at gravity and um, we use Newton's law of universal gravitation, where uh, F equals GM1 M2 over R squared, that says that we have to be on a sphere. Um, so that fundamental equation, uh, the, the law of gravity uh, as it's called, is that something that you dispute? Um, I have to dispute it as uh, pseudoscience at this point. I, I think everything that um, we've um, been pretty much educated on has been to reinforce this basic notion of the spinning ball and heliocentrism. And so, no, I, I really don't think we should be appealing to ancient Greeks either. I hate it when people say all the Greeks knew it was a ball. I don't think that's valid. Um, personally, I think the arguments that are made for the ball and for flat Earth, a lot of them are bad. Um, I don't think that um, boats go over the horizon. Okay, but I don't um, think we should feel the Earth spinning if it were spinning. I mean, that didn't really answer the question of, um, do you agree that there is this downward accelerating force that is making things accelerate towards the ground? Oh, yeah. As I said earlier, yeah, I, I don't dispute any of what we observe. I'm just saying that the uh, underlying causes or explanations are being skewed. So they're taking real science and then they're augmenting it with a little bit of, uh, you know, a little bit of ball, throw some curve in there. They're okay. throwing us all for a, a little so, curve here with this stuff. The, the thing about the, the acceleration is that um, it changes depending on where you are on the Earth. Uh, you know, and the centrifugal acceleration can be slightly different at certain points. And based on the math of our model, you know, we can calculate exactly what the acceleration should be at what points on the Earth. So why would the acceleration be different at different points on the Earth? And why would that comport with, with the model of it being a sphere? Uh, that's a good question. But also when you're starting off with the presumption you're on a ball and you're measuring the acceleration at different points, you know, you're starting with that as an assumption that you know the size to be 25K. And I don't think that starting, I think you've got to start ground zero. And I'm saying flat and rejecting the stuff that comes from NASA, the space agencies, and anything trickling down from that, assuming this basic paradigm to be true. I mean, this also throws in, into um, question uh, timelines involved. You know, Big Bang, how many, is the Earth 4 billion years old, dinosaurs, all this stuff is up for question right now, in my mind. Okay, I mean, there's so much to unpack there. Um, I just want to kind of really stick with the, the gravity thing at the moment, because there isn't an assumption of the ball. Um, when you do these gravity measurements, um, you know, you can do the Cavendish experiment uh, and um, there's a similar similar thing called the Shishelian experiment where they literally manage, they, they use the, the mass of a mountain to register the, the movement of a plumb bob. And the, it shows that mass attracts mass, not just downwards, but, you know, sideways, whichever, wherever mass is, mass attracts mass. And based on the calculations that we get from these experiments that are repeatable uh, and are done all the time, you know, the only way that they work out is if we have a sphere. You know, the, the, the maths for the universal law of gravitational attraction doesn't work if you're on a flat disk. Or a plane. Well, this is, yeah, this is, I guess, what I want to see fine-tuned. And this is where this argument ultimately has to go is um, where is the legitimate science ending and where is ideology being inserted? There are people who can say with equal certainty that the Earth is heating up and climate change is a fact. And I'm saying, well, where does your actual meteorology end and your agenda of saying the Earth is overheating because of America, where is that being inserted? And I think that the science has been corrupted. I think everything you're citing, um, the information you're citing from it sounds legit, but I'm really calling into question whether you can cite these as sources. Well, like I said, when there's things that are done all the time, like the Cavendish experiment, and it clearly shows that there is an attraction between mass, it, it leads you to only one conclusion. Look, um, I've got a guy who calls me up sometimes. Um, he was a um, he was in the he was in the Coast Guard, and this is like in 2001, and they went and they did a circumnavigation, and so you know at the time he believed he was on a ball. Anyway, he was up on the lookout deck, and I asked him, how high up were you? He said, 40 feet up above sea level with the bug-eye lenses. 
And he said he was getting visual confirmation of boats at 60 miles away, verified by radar. 60 miles consistently the whole trip and so we did a little bit of math on this and it's like well look the math there would say that we're not on the ball because these vessels should not have been visible from that view from that from that distance and so visual confirmation at 60 miles and 40 feet up would be contradicted um by I mean, this I, eight inch. I would love to to see you know the the, the photos and everything corroborating that but obviously whenever you're talking about photos and looking at stuff that there is refraction to be taken into account and it kind of works both ways you know globe earthers can say oh that's that was refraction causing that and so can flat earthers and it's very hard to actually say without being there and knowing the the, the humidity um the temperature above the water and everything exactly what you should be able to see at what point but you know that that's not really something tangible and hard that i can go and recreate myself and and it just comes back to something as simple as the Cavendish experiment proving that mass attracts mass. And the reason I keep bringing that up is because the math works when you do it from the center of something to the center of something. And that itself means that we have to be on a sphere. Okay, I'm going to take a closer look at all this and, and we'll have to do a follow up. I just want to point out, look, if we're right, there are certain things that no longer can exist. So if the Earth is not a ball, if there is no low Earth orbit, um, then there's zero chance of nuclear holocaust. Mm -hmm. Nothing's going to be flying over that distance. Um, if this is the case, global warming is going to be fake, and you don't have to worry about asteroids. And they said that we're going to be wiped out in 2029. We've got to get to Mars because that asteroid Apophis is scheduled to come kill us on that Friday the 13th in April. Well, if we're right, None of these things that you have to fear need to be feared anymore. Well, um, I don't think I fear anything like uh, astro uh, asteroids or anything, because if it was coming, we wouldn't be able to do anything about it. Um, but it's all very kind of wishy-washy from your point. I'm not trying to be rude, but um, there, there is no solidness coming from any of your arguments. It's very much just you think that everyone is lying to you. Therefore, these things are probably, well, improbable. Um, well, no, it's pretty solid when I'm seeing through, as a video editor, green screen, when I see a rear screen projection, when I see uh, a lack of parallax, appropriate parallax on the moon footage. So what I'm saying is, no, what I'm being shown is a bunch of cartoons. And it reminds me of when I was a kid, I was, I was given a lot of myths to believe with a religion. And with the space program, it's the same thing. I'm just choosing not to believe in your really expensive, overpriced religious art that pretends to be a description of reality and our place in it. That's all. And it's not wishy-washy because what you're giving us is utter crap. If the ISS gave us graphics as good as that movie Sandra Bullock was in, Gravity, I'd be on board. I'd be totally on board. But what they show us has too many holes in it, and it would. I'm, I'm just doing due diligence here. See, I'm, you know, I'm not even that I'm, radical of a skeptic. Even talking about the ISS, I've never seen any footage that couldn't be explained with, with you know, normal logic. Uh, and, you know, I honestly, I've never seen anything that has convinced me that anything on the ISS is fake. Uh, I, you know, I've seen all the videos that a lot of flat earthers put out saying that, oh, this person just faded out um, all of a sudden. And, oh, well, this person was clearly on a harness. And, you know, it, it, it's all just incredulity more than anything. Um, wait, wait, wait. Did you see the one where the microphone went inside of Chris Hedfield's neck? No blood. And that microphone head went into his throat. That's how bad the augmented virtual reality layers were overlapping. And we're laughing at this stuff. We're laughing because Chris Hedfield has a microphone stuck through his neck, and you guys got to pretend like you can't see that. You got to mm. pretend like you can't see it. It's a naked emperor, and we're saying he's got no clothes. And you're like, oh, well, you just don't have the sophistication to see these fine robes. No, see, I, uh, I've not seen one with a microphone in the throat, uh, but all the, maybe I have, I'm not sure. But uh, all the ones I've seen, for instance, the, um, I'm sure you've seen the one where there's an astronaut going off to a side room and he kind of fades out as he's going into the side room. And that can be explained yeah, as a, simply as awesome. a transition between scenes, you know, um, the the rest of the room's not changing. The only thing changing there is the the fact the astronaut is moving. So if the scene is transitioned as the astronaut leaves the room, it's going to look like he's just disappearing. 
if you're then putting up just a, a, an image of the room with nothing in. You know, it's simple of things like right. that. That'd, and... be a, that'd be a crossfade. Okay, a crossfade wouldn't count. Okay, here's one for you. There's one where Chris Hetfield is eating asparagus, and it's really gross. Really? He's, like, licking his fingers, and I'm like, dude, how many times have you washed your hands up there? In 20 years, the same astronauts and cosmonauts have been using that same toilet. And so he's sitting there with his fingers eating asparagus. Because, you know, using sanitizer in your hands isn't enough. So he's, using a, he's eating asparagus. And you actually see him cutting the packet open with the scissors. And there's a point in the video, look it up, Chris Hetfield eating asparagus, where the scissors disappear and move to the other side of the room. They glitch. That glitch cannot be explained with logic. It can be explained with Final Cut Pro 4 and sloppy editing. Come on. I can edit better than that. So uh, th th this is one thing that gets me, right? Is that NASA are clever enough to have perpetrated this hoax for, for the last 50 years at least. Uh, you know, they fooled everyone into thinking that the, the, the Earth, uh, that we went to the moon. They managed to do amazing effects, you know, 50 years ago that most movie producers say would have been impossible back then. But they're also stupid enough to leave in a glitch of something popping from one side of the room to the other. Uh, if, if I was an organization perpetrating this enormous hoax, I would not let shit like that slip through. I've only just started using Adobe After Effects and stuff and learning the intricacies of compositing and everything. And, you know, I wouldn't make those mistakes. So I don't think if NASA were smart enough to do this, they would also be stupid enough to make those little mistakes. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a very good point. And I think, um, and I've noticed this not just with space, but with a lot of the news on the ground. Like, and there is a lot of fake news, we can agree. Like Jesse Smollett, fake lynched himself. You know, we see these um, instances of fake news uh, hoaxes leaking out there. You know, 66% of reported hate crimes have turned out to be fake. So uh, what I'm saying is this. It's always been this way. The space program has always been sloppy. The media hoaxes have always been sloppy. The difference is in 2019, everyone has a smartphone and everybody shares information. So the difference is now we're finally noticing and they weren't ready for it. In other words, we woke up as a collective of hypercritical, awake individuals scrutinizing this footage. We're paying attention and talking. But you could look back 10 years, 20 years, 25 years, and it's laughable. They contradict themselves so many times. The Coke wars with Pepsi and Coke went up to outer space, and they were drinking Pepsi and Coke in space. Well, now they say, and this is from NASA's, uh, their food department, but oh, we can't have carbonation in space. It doesn't work. So, like, which is it? Coke bars in space, or you can't drink carbonation in space because the way the carbonation doesn't, uh, it doesn't separate properly or whatever. They're constantly contradicting themselves. They've been sloppy and goofy from day one. The Challenger astronauts are not dead. Come on now. that's. I'd rather not go there because uh, I, I find that, disrespectful to the families of, of, of those people. Um, well, I find it disrespectful that those people would disrespect billions of people on the earth, including school children, that they traumatize. That footage wasn't live. There's no reason for they, them to have wheeled those TVs into our classrooms and showed us the footage. Oh, look, kids, we're going to watch a rocket go up. They knew it blew up because that was a replay. So if anybody should be offended, it's me and everybody right. here who had to watch that BS. So, no, I don't think they're dead. I think the whole thing's a farce. I think that Yuri Gagarin, the first man in space, is also Neil Armstrong. And I wouldn't be surprised if Buzz Aldrin isn't just George C. Scott. It's just an act. Right. Um, I think we're going to have to end it there then. Um, uh, when it gets to talks about things like the Challenger and that, uh, I find it very hard to continue. Um, so uh, I do want to say that it's up, it's been a, a pretty good talk with you uh, up to this point. Um, but that, that just, f for me, that's a, just a line I kind of can't cross and continue to have a conversation. Um, so uh, I'm going to... Sure, the feeling's mutual. Look, man, it's a shock. It's a big slap in the face to find out you've been lied to and deceived and you're on the other side of it. And I think that you'll feel the same thing when you realize that you've been duped. I appreciate you taking the time. I'll look into all the things that you brought up, and I will um, let you know what I think. And then if you want to discuss those things in particular, we'll go back over those. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining me today. Uh, and, yeah, that, that was an interesting talk. Have a nice night. Likewise. <clears throat> yeah, I... Uh... 
I, I can't carry on when, I mean, people, you know, they died. Uh, and not only were they heroes for doing what they did, but, you know, there, there's families that they have to deal with. Um, so, yeah, I couldn't, could not continue the conversation after that point. Oh, man, uh, that's that's been an interesting night. I see people in the chat saying that they, they think to, that, that he's a troll. Um, I've looked into Tim Osman quite a lot, uh, and I don't think that th this Tim Osman is a troll. Uh, I think he genuinely believes what he says. Um, I don't think he's got any hard evidence for what he says, like all flat earthers. Uh, but I, I, I honestly don't think he's a troll. Um, yeah, so th there is that. <laughs> Uh, well, that was interesting. Guys, I hope you've been enjoying my uh, new stuff. Uh, like, what, what do you think of my um, my animated globe here? Let me just get myself out of the way uh, and I'll show you. Yeah, look at that. Uh, I actually made that out of a flat picture. Let me show you the picture that I made it from. Where is it? So here we go. Yeah. So I actually, I made that globe in After Effects using this picture. Um, oh, no, that's wrong. All right, yeah, so I put that picture in After Effects and then used some fancy effects, turned it into a sphere, made it cartoon-like, uh, and now it, it's all spinny and then added the FTFE thing. I'm quite happy with it. I'm, I'm loving playing with After Effects as a, a funky new editing tool. Uh, I hope you guys realize that it actually takes me ages to edit now because I've got to do those hologram stuff, but it's worth it because I think it looks good. But we're going to close it up there tonight, guys. I'm going to read off the Super Chats uh, and then we're going to shut down. So let me just get my super chats up. As always, guys, thank you very much for joining me. Uh, really, it means a lot to, to see you guys here and supporting what I'm doing. I absolutely love it. Uh, community. Super chats. Okay. And we're starting off with 99.99 US dollars from Thomas Miller. Thank you very much. FTFE, I finally made it in time for a super chat. Prepare the FE butthurt. Thank you, Thomas Miller. Yeah, honestly, you don't know how much it means. Uh, you know, it really, really does help support me. And 10 Canadian dollars from Adam uh, Joski. $10 is all I can afford. Keep fighting a good fight, FTFE, in the early time. Thank you very much. It means a lot. $2 from Rangerman9404. Test message. Um, test received. $2 from Paul Reap, no message, thank you. $5 from 0132132. Question for Osman, do you believe in GM M1 over M2 equals R squared? Yeah, I asked him that. Um, he managed to skirt around the answer quite a lot, as all flat earthers do. Uh, $4.99 from Steve1758. This guy is a moron. The space race was actually a weapons race. Uh, space Force, woo. One ninety nine from Stephen Steen. Lol, FTFE believes in evolution. What a moron. Yeah, who thinks we came from monkeys? Dope. One ninety nine from Stephen Steen. If anyone thinks I'm wrong, do a response vid. Please, someone do a response vid to Stephen Steen. That'd be funny. Five pound from John Watson. With a decent telescope and correct shutter speed, you'll get a sharp image of the ISS. Yes. Ten rons from Luce and Andreas. I thought heaven is a paradise, not the lack of it. Two ninety nine from James, uh, US dollars from James Collins. Reds is working with Jaronism. Wow. Yeah, somebody should tell him. Uh, 1099, sorry, 999 US dollars from Ivy Blankenship. Ask, given a rail gun 20 meters over the water, shoot uh, horizontal with a velocity of 2,000 meters a second. How long to hit the surface and travel how far? Answer, two seconds and less than four kilometers. Yeah, um, no matter how fast them it's going, like if you shoot it forward, it's still got a downward acceleration going on it. Like if you, um, Mythbusters did this, right? Uh, and if you had a gun, and then something, and you fired the gun and dropped something at the same time. The bullet that you fired 
will still hit the ground at the same time as the thing you've dropped because they've both got that downward acceleration on them. It's just the bullets also going that way. Uh, five dollars from Andrew Stoll. My God, I'm so sick of the I don't know what it is, but I know it's not that dishonest. Yep. Ten Australian dollars from John Rapp. Tim has distanced himself from stupid fighter of claims. He appears to be Bible brainwashed, but he is reaching when denying our positive evidence. Good on him for being polite and reasonable. One ninety nine US dollars from Stephen Steen. Marcus timed me out because I distracted him. Well, don't distract him then. And five pound from Keith Milner. Headfield uh, Mick video is an obvious video artifact. Um, yeah, I was. I'm actually going to cover the um, NASA fakes as one of my stupid humans. Uh, only someone looking for a conspiracy would consider it to be suspicious. Let's just check for any more. Uh, did you ask him about eclipses? No, I had. Um, I, I'm sorry I didn't get to ask him any more questions, but I had to end it because he started talking about the Challenger disasters and he'd mentioned school shootings earlier. And um, see, the thing is, right, that most flat earthers are also these people that are into, you know, saying school shootings are fake and, you know, Holocaust deniers and, and all that because it's all part of the conspiracy mindset and it is very hard to find a flat earther to talk to that isn't also into these other things so it becomes a fine line as to at what point i carry on the conversation and what point i have to kind of be respectful of, of stuff that's happened um and i think just talking about the the challenger disaster uh, after already saying about school shooting it was a line that I couldn't keep things going. So uh, I hope no one's angry at me for that. Um, but I, I also hope you understand where I'm going with that. Um, but yeah, that's it for tonight, guys. I would love it if you would check out my recent videos. I released one yesterday that was my first foray outside of Flat Earth um, called Stupid Human Thinks Man Lives With Dinosaurs. Uh, and you know what? I don't know if anyone has seen this or not, but there is a video that I have to play because, oh, $5 from Stringer News, last, thank you. <laughs> um, where is it? So, yeah, Rider of Dinosaurs sent me this. Um, and it's a video of Mark Sargent. Uh, just bear with me while I get this up. So th this is Mark Sargent, guys. <clears throat> just enjoy for a second. Oh, I should probably press play, eh? That would help. Flat Earth expert Mark Sargent thinks the moon landing was a hoax. Technically, the moon itself is a hoax. Right, but betting with Sportsbet's new iPhone app? I could do this standing on my head. Thanks, Gravity. Sportsbet's new iPhone app. It's foolproof. I mean, he does realise that he just had the piss taken out of him, right? Um... Is, is he so stupid that he doesn't realize that that was taking the mick out of him? Or is he just so much of a po that he was happy to take the money for the advert? Uh, what do you guys think? I'm going to leave you that. Num uh, put one in the chat if you think he's so stupid he doesn't realize he's having the piss taken out of him. Put two in the chat if you think he's a po and was just happy to take the money. Uh, and with that, guys, remember that stupidity is not a right. Fight the flatter. Fight the flat. Fight the flat. Fight the flat. Fight the fight. Fight the fight. Fight the flat. Fight the flat. Fight. I didn't. Fight the flat. Fight the flat. Fight the flat. Fight the fight. Fight the flat. Fight the flat. Fight the flat. Fight the flat.